Welcome to Americana Quill, cool. writer to writer. Please like and subscribe and tell a friend that likes to subscribe. Today we are doing the third episode of Lovecraft Country with my friend Jesse Creighton. And basically we are going to discuss episode three. And let me just give a brief synopsis for the viewers before we get into it. Three weeks after George's funeral, Letty uses an unexpected inheritance from her deceased mother to buy a, a Vic, basically a Victorian mansion in an all-white neighborhood on Chicago's north side, filling it with black renters together with her, with her half-sister Ruby. The white neighbors harass them and burn a cross on the lawn. A white supremacist police officer, Captain Lancaster, threatens Letty inside the house. Supernatural activity flares up. Letty learns that the previous owner was a white scientist, Hiram Epstein. With the help of Lancaster, he kidnapped, experimented on, and killed eight black people before buying them under the house. All nine spirits are trapped there. With the help of a medium and the black spirits, Letty banishes Epstein, malevolent ghosts. Later, Atticus finds Christina birthright in Chicago. She survived the fire. Atticus has deducted that she was secretly the source of the inheritance and has steered Letty to the house. Christina explains that the house was built by Har Harito Winthrop, a son of Adam, member banished after stealing pages from the Book of Names in the 1800s. And the Epstein was a follower of Winthrop. She asks Atticus to help her find the missing pages which could help decipher the language of Adam. Atticus Adams to shoot her. Uh, oh, sorry, Atticum, Atticus attempts to shoot her, but he's not able to pull the trigger. So episode three, I felt was really good. Um, this is the episode that helps you see a little bit more into the future of all the other future, of all the other episodes, I should say. I should say. Yeah. So with episode three, I felt like it was deep, but it was more of like foreshadowing what's to come for like you to stay interested in the story and not like lose yourself and not care to do any more of watching, if that makes sense. So how did you initially feel about episode three? Um, when I first saw it, I was I was excited because you got to learn more um, more relationships and you got to see the way that they interact when they're not, you know, out looking for you know, for Montrose. And when the, the episode opens up, they open up at church, which makes sense because of the last two episodes, they needed to go to church. Like everything they went to, they needed to find and be settled. And when Letty's sitting there, there was a poem that was being said, and it's, it says, which an angels gave you their wings? Which skies have you flown? And when you reach the heavens, who was there to catch you when you fell? It's a poem that's by a lady named Precious Ebony. And for her to sit there and think about that while everybody is praising um, just a deep thought of everything that she's been through so far mm -hmm. and everything that's, you know, backstory that you don't actually see, like, like it was a good opening scene for right. the episode. And it's true, who's there to catch you? You know, like who's there to do it? No one's there and you have to like everyone that she was with, like she's blessed to have around them because they oh, absolutely. love and care for her. And Letty's trying to find her purpose in life. Right, Letty's still in a place of, of seeking of, and finding herself, right? So mm -hmm. it is told that she got an inheritance and therefore she was able to buy the mansion. And this hurts Ruby, which I found very important inside of the story. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you didn't even show up to mama's funeral, but yeah, you still get everything. It was like yeah. her whole oh, thought process. And I really felt for her in that moment because it's like, Ruby was like the caregiver for the mom for her, like her last days. So like for you to like be disrespected in such a way, I can only imagine that being so hurtful and so, you know, so disturbing. But it's like, 
that part didn't make sense to me until later episodes because of how she really got the inheritance. Yeah. You know, until you really find out how she got the inheritance. But I thought that episode was interesting. And then moving them into, which is something I talk about, not necessarily always on this podcast, but it's just because of where we grew up, that it, it makes it makes sense geographically of like, kind of like redlining. So like them now moving to a part of town that they're not wanted just from a, like a, a racial standpoint and like them always being forced usually to, to be in the South side. And now yeah. you find your way out of it, but you doing that is just probably putting more people in harm, even though it's like, we have every right to be here too. Yeah. So I find that very interesting of her buying a house and in order to keep up the house with the rent and everything else and to get things fixed, she decides to rent out a lot of the rooms. Yeah. So. Which I like that. Personally, um, a boarding house is a great thing to have. Uh, they're strengthening numbers. And why not build a community that you want? No, you no, know, of course. You know, personally, we, as people now, we could all chip in $10,000 and go 10 people deep and go buy land somewhere in the middle of the country and make our own, you know, community. No, of course. Um, and I think that that was a step in the direction of Letty growing up. Right, Letty growing up, but it's like a lot of other cultures do it too, right? It's like Asian yeah. culture, that's like a thing. If like a family will buy a, one house, they all chip away at the mortgage so there's no more debt. And then from there, it's like, let's find another house and let's do that again, you know, until yeah. this house is built up. But they do it in a way where it's even cooler because like they do it for buildings. They don't just do it necessarily for them. A big giant mansion right so it's yeah. just interesting on, on the thought process on how to get there no i agree with that to me i don't know when it was like cool to just you know let a kid turn 18 and push them out like you know yeah you should have a house where you know everyone should be living together and paying rent and you know growing old together and helping out because to me nobody in the world cares about you but the people that are your family that or at least that brought you into the world, hopefully. Yeah, you know, right. or anyone that you consider family, like, like, and it, I rather have people around me that I love and I want to, you know, be around. And right. like I said, they're strengthening numbers, especially moving on to an, uh, into a neighborhood that, you know, they're not used to seeing you. Right. But like the, when the resources are there, of course you want to move there and, I think it just shows that sometimes the grass don't always seem green on the other side because as soon as some issues appeared, a lot of them were like ready to leave. They didn't want to stay. They didn't care. You know, they were like, we should have never even done this in the first place. So, but Letty, Letty and Tick seeing this decided to move in because of that because he, he didn't care. He wasn't scared of them the way everyone else might be scared of yeah. whatever might come to them. Tick was like, nope. Like he always does, Tick is going to step up to the occasion and protect, you right. know, and like seeing the episode and seeing like, he's the reason why Uncle George died and him stepping up, you know, and trying to fill the shoes of Uncle George and help out around the house, help out and make sure that the guide is being published. Right. Um, and... I can understand why he's, you know, so, why he has such a guilty conscience. You right. know, because he's trying to do all, he didn't mean for it to happen. And it seems like he's noticing that his welcome is being over, overwhelmed, like overstayed. And right. that's why he like, he sees on top of that with the stuff that happens at the house with, you know, the people. He's like, yeah, I definitely have to stay around and I definitely have to move in because everybody still needs me. You know, I still have to clean up everything that I did. And I need to give space to my to my aunt because obviously she um, she doesn't believe the story that me and my father told. So therefore, it's like, it's probably best I leave out. And it shows when he try, he's doing all these things that are like showing that he's a doting cousin, right? And, and nephew. However, it's like you you're not even supposed to be here. Like yeah. George is supposed to be in my in your place right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, and when he senses that, when he's trying to cook them eggs and get everything ready for them, he he senses it himself that okay, I'll overstay my welcome for sure. Like, and this is just the moment right here, because Uncle George does things a certain way, and I'm doing it a different way, and she's not even 
separating the two right now. It's like, no, like George had his coffee like this, kind of like whatever with the mugs. Yeah, it was. That was it. He washed them and flipped them over and he didn't wash them. He just left them there, you know, up right side up. Um, but I do respect him for what he tried to do. You know, that's what I would have done if, you know, God forbid something happened in my family. I would definitely try and step up to be helpful, especially because Dee just lost her father. Right. It's not like there's like, it's not like she has anyone else, you know, she has Montrose barely when he's sober, you know, but you see everybody in this episode try and step up for HIPAA, Hippolyta and um, D. Right. And, um, trying to see, like even talking about the brothers, like them growing up, like Uncle George and Montrose are brothers and they grew up in this, they grew up the same way, but they're two totally different people. Like, you Absolutely. Know, and I think that's another thing that the writers got too with making sure that they wrote it the right way. Like, you could tell that they're family, but you could tell that they've been through stuff together, but apart that they don't want right. to talk about. Different experiences that they keep to themselves, kind of, yeah. yeah. Well, what I found interesting is as soon as he felt like he overstayed his welcome, he then tries to go to his father's house who he doesn't have the greatest relationship with, but then he sees Montrose drunk, acting crazy, and him, I believe, reminiscent of a dream, the same dream that Tick had, but in a different way a little bit with Jackie Robinson saving the day, basically of a moment in his childhood with, with a bat and swinging away. So basically, um, Montrose is not in a good way, either drunk in the middle of the day and relieving a memory from his him, him and George you. So he said it so many times that Tick knew it word for word, basically, and then yeah. smiled about it. But he's also ashamed. He's like, yo, you're drunk. And this is all you're thinking about. Like, this is all you can do right now is just be drunk because you only think about yourself. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, your, your sister in law and your, your niece is, you know, going through something. And this is all you can do is just drink and be, whoa, it's me kind of moments. Right. Yeah. And it's like, that's something that Tick can't stand because it's like, you used to beat my ass. And it's like, all you did my whole life to me would be a fucking drunk. And like, that's what frustrates them the most. It's like, so. When I went there, when I first saw it, I thought he was going there for, you know, a place to live, but. I like, think that was his intentions that. too, though. But then he noticed that and he was like, oh, okay, no, I can't do Yeah, this. I don't know. I didn't get that. I got more of a, he went there to speak to his father about how he was feeling guilty about what they told her. And, that too. you know, and basically, you know, him, Montrose being drunk, you know, he stood up and he obviously, like, made a flashback for Tick, and Tick literally retreated to a child and got up like he was going to get beat, and they were going back and forth, and Montrose is like, we can't tell Hippolyta the real thing, because she, like, he, do he doesn't think at the time that she could be helpful to, or handle, you know, learning Oof. about wizards and everything, yeah, learning the truth, and I think they're selling her short, you know, um, right. but I always feel like the, the woman is the, the backbone of the family and they can handle more things than everyone else. I agree, but I think the reason why they, they set her so short is because she played a position to be George's, you know, underneath mm -hmm. George instead of people really knowing her, the, her true self and her true worth and her true personality. And that's when I think she's frustrated when she rips up that Dracula book. Yeah. And I it's think because that she had so much to say to her husband who. Although we think he's trying to be loving and, and doting and protecting, I was telling her, no, you can't go, like, not this time. She feels like she could have made a difference if, if, yeah. if, she, if she was to go. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. She definitely would feel like that because, you know, God forbid something ever happened like that to Cameron, I would be like, no, let me go, you know, mm -hmm. or let me be. But someone has to stay back and, you know, run the spaceship when, mm -hmm. one, you know, someone's got to go. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my first question, even though we talked a little bit of, of some scenes that we thought were very poignant and important is, what was your favorite scene? My favorite scene was, I have two of them because I really, <laughs> I couldn't pick all the way, but the, when Letty brings in the voodoo lady and starts to cleanse the house and everything and try and get rid of all of the spirits and everything. Yeah, that um, was too much for me. 
like them being in the basement and you know the the people that were murdered they showed up first and tick was getting you know he was getting taken over by the the demon and the way he acted phenomenal like always you know never anything bad about him <laughs> like and then like the voodoo lady gets hit and smashed away and then it's up to them to and then at the end like they use the spirits that were killed you know to to banish the man that killed them the one right. that was torturing the house because to me you know a soul or a ghost that's haunting a house is going to haunt anybody they don't care who you are Right. You know, but when you're presenting yourself, you know, because you're the new owner without doing the research, um, when they, the, the spirits figured out that they were trying to help and they, she embraced them and they all got mm -hmm. into a circle and they banished him. That was, it was so good. Like it, it was a mind blowing thing that I've never seen before or never even been like taken back to seeing something like that. Right. And the only reason why she found out it was haunted and she realized things were weird, but she didn't know why because she was hearing things. I wanted to backtrack a little bit just to give the, um, the viewers more context and the listeners, is when the cops um, came for a, a noise complaint, basically, because of the fire in the lawn. Then the then they put the bricks over the, um, the steering wheels, I believe, to like honk the horns to bring them outside. And then they didn't know that they were about that business. And basically, they all had... Um, Letty's people had guns, and they pulled them out and started shooting and, and breaking up cars and everything else. And that's my second favorite episode, part of the episode, is when, mm. you know, they, the white people, they didn't like it. They showed up and the first, you know, intimidation tactic was I'm going to sit on, you know, park my cars in front of your house and put a brick there and sit on it. They right. seen that, you know, it didn't really phase anybody. Um, and when those people, they, they started with the, you know, with the cars and the bricks on the horn. That didn't work. They saw that it didn't phase them. They were still having, you know, going on about to have their housewarming party. And then they overstepped their boundaries, you know, using their privilege. And they went onto their property, you know, and then they right. burned the cross. And at that point, I loved Letty because Letty was like, I had enough. I'm done. Right. This is, this is my property. You disrespected it by coming onto it. And you're burning a cross. There's children in the house. And the fact of they, they got, like, everybody stood behind her. And everybody knew what they needed to do. She went outside and she didn't back down. She, you, she did everything that she needed to do. She busted those windows with no regrets. She did what she did. Right. And when everybody had her back... And they, you know, Ruby even pulled out in the wagon and grabbed everything and dipped off. Like it was, it was yeah. a perfect thing. And that's it was. To, it was to show that we could do, we could be, we could fight dirty too. And I, that's what I love yeah. about it. Like your intimidation tactics don't scare me at all. They're not going to scare us, and you're not going to come onto my property and think something's not going to happen. Right. And it it was really good. Those are the two scenes that I was like, I really loved in that episode. Yeah, I think for me, my favorite scene is um, just just Montrose just being that freaking crazy drunk, just yeah. <laughs> and just him having the flashback, I guess, of uh, a, a good time of him and his brother George. Because I think you know the viewers are would miss George after definitely seeing that he passed because he was such a, a guiding light for um, Tick, and obviously was a great big brother to um, to Montrose. To, him to even remember the, the same stories and stuff and like be revered and think about that so much so but I felt that like that was my favorite scene personally no go ahead no I was saying like that scene like the one that you're talking about it mm -hmm. it's hard to to watch in a way because you know you don't ever want to see like Atticus relive his childhood or any of them have to do that but to build the story like you yeah. know you have to see certain things like that but I was going to say which, which ties into a lot more of deeper stories within by the time the, episode, the season ends I should say um what I was going to say in reference to the scene about the intimidation tactics by the, the people in the neighborhood it mm. makes me think back to 2015 when that black family moved into Lindenhurst Okay, yeah, I heard and about that. And remember how they got a letter saying that they didn't want them there? And it's like, it that was in 2015, you know? Yeah. 
this thing that very much happened today. It's, it's sad, right? Yeah. Um, but when I saw that, that's what it made me think of because though that family was an amazing family and they didn't deserve mm -hmm. any of that mm -hmm. just because, you know, they're not white. Some, right. And, you know, that things happen a lot on Long Island, unfortunately. Yeah. You learn a lot. Like, I definitely learned a lot, you know, just learning living on Long Island. Um, just looking over at my notes, I'm trying to see. I, I loved getting to see Ruby sing again. I think right. that is her color. Um, she looked beautiful and it was such a perfect song that she was singing, you know, party mm. until midnight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so who had your favorite performance in the episode, I guess, from an actor standpoint? Also. Letty, because she showed so much strength as a woman. Like, she wasn't going to back down. You weren't going to scare her. Mm. And also, rewatching it, she bought that house. And after the, you know, police grabbed her up and said, you don't even know what's going on in this house. You don't even know the history. Right. You put her up on what is happening. Yeah. Um, and I also learned that the people that they killed... You know, they were the ones that were digging the tunnel in the basement. Mm. Um, I learned that when I was listening to it, the police, um, he said something about it. Um, trying to say. Um, and the, it kind of gives me American Horror Story type things, like with the murder house. Um, mm -hmm. and like I told you when we were talking before, the whole monster house type movie, like that's yeah. what the house is based off of, like something like that, where it's being controlled, you know, on its by, own. By some type of magical evil spirit at times, yeah. yeah. Especially well, the elevator. The elevator is like a, a foreshadowing of things happening, like, yeah, like one minute the elevator doesn't work. But then it decides to work out of nowhere and it almost hurts Letty until she moves out the way. And yeah. then when these three um, Caucasian men thought they were going to harm them when they finally saw that Letty was back in the house after coming back from being arrested, tries to do harm to them. And they all, I think it killed in a different part of the room. And then somehow they all end up in the basement somewhere. Yeah, I was like, it took its head off and how does his body get in the basement? <laughs> his yeah, was it's, it's just some parts you're just not going to understand. However, like, it was a great way of foreshadowing. It's like, you know, like, sometimes you should just mind your business kind of thing. And, like, that was, like, a perfect lesson. Yep. Moment. Mind your business. For sure. You know, stay on your side of the street. Right. Um, I also was talking about... Um, with the voodoo part of it. Like, it's kind of you learn a little bit where, you know, Christina finally shows up, you know, to make herself known that she's in Chicago and she can't even get into the house because she's not welcomed. She has to be right. welcomed in to be able to get into the house. And she was also going there to look for the solar system that Hippolyta found, but she didn't really find it. It kind of presented itself to her. To, right, like but, I, not, up. but was it in that episode or a different episode? No, it was in it was in episode three. Okay. It was right after um it was right after the kids were playing with the uh, Luigi board, which I wrote down everything. The Luigi board is telling um those kids and D that George is dead. Mm -hmm. Like when it spelled it out, it just says George is dead. Um but she was uh Hippolyta was looking for them and she went to say, Kids, are you up there? And they didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. and then the door opens and it like presented itself to her and then that's Got when she it. grabs it and takes it to the light to the library and she like calls her dad she's trying to figure it out because she's never seen a solar system that had two sons right. and like that's another thing where it goes into the scientific stuff where it's like now she's learning that there's more yeah, and I, I don't think it was a library I think she took it to um, George's office where the guides are oh, maybe. I'm no, I Tick was at the but library. It, right, Tick was at the library yeah, when he. <laughs> no, no, it's a lot going on, so it makes sense. So yeah, I also, I don't know, I enjoyed this whole episode, but like another important scene to me that was very poignant was um, Tick at the library. He does his research and finds out why um, why Christina wants some like some of these things, and from there he he figures he could settle it all because. 
he's the first one to realize that you, you didn't get that house really from inheritance. How did you get it? He kind of like confronts Letty a little bit about it and finds out that it came from Christina. Yeah. So him, he walks into like somewhere and she was there and he's right. Oh, like, no, he saw her across the street. I think at like a, um, a realtor's office that she just bought yeah. basically. So then he goes back to, I guess a home of his or one of the houses that he frequents at and grabs his gun and said, I'll be back mm. or whatever. He doesn't really tell them why. Cause I think he saw them before anyone else saw her. Yeah. So then he gets the gun or whatever. And then that's when he tries to like have the guy close up shop. And then he tries to kill her, but he can't because she has to type a spell on him yeah. even trying to attempt such a thing on him. And then she just talked to him for like two minutes and keeps him stuck. But I don't remember exactly what she was saying, but I know it's, Fairly important. Yeah. I'm trying to think. So what spoke to you most about episode three, I guess, is, is like a question. Like a um, what spoke to me most is when <laughs> they finally started to realize that they need to start figuring stuff out. Like when they all started to like, like George is gone. You know, he was the one that was doing all of it. So obviously you guys got to do your own work now. And the fact that, you know, Tick and Letty and Hippolyte, like it was an episode of research, you know? Yeah. Like, um, everybody was trying to do their research to figure out everything. And they were all learning new things. And right. Dee was coping with losing her father and, you know, hanging out with kids and trying to be a kid, you know? Right. So I would say to encompass all of episode three basically was like, this is where the, the, their plots were at one point all together. Now you start getting to each individual subplot before they probably come back together towards the season finale, if that makes sense. I agree with that because okay. it's yeah. only going to get better, guys. Pretty much because episode three, Hepale is on some, which I think is a Greek word or Greek name, but I don't know what it stands for. I'm sure that her name has a, a meaning behind it. I, we should look that up, actually. Right. Let me see. Right. Um. How you spell her name again in the series? If you have it written down. It's like a. I wrote it down. Hold on. That's her name is Greek, and then it's her being into like. Certain, you know, yeah, <laughs> I agree. Like I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, her name is H I P P O L Y T A. Yeah, in classical Greek, Hippolyta was a daughter of Ares and Arteta, queen of the Amazons, and a sister of Endotope. And she, so basically, she was Wonder Woman before Wonder Woman, is basically what yeah. this name. <laughs> Um, her dignity, a girl. Dignity like when I call you Hippolyta, like her, all Ruby. I think everybody gives their all, but I think the women come ten times harder when you start right. to see them um, acting. Like, guys, we haven't even touched the surface of really what's going to happen yet. Right. Um, I'm trying to think that those are all really the notes that I have for episode three. Yeah. Um, um, I didn't really like. I like that the um. I like that they added D in there being a child. You know. Yeah, it showed her being a kid and not dealing with all the real life issues. I yeah, you know, that. doing what kids do, play with freaking Luigi boards. Because I definitely did it when I was younger. And you know, did you? How did yeah, that I go? Would never do it again. <laughs> never ever. Mm. Um, but the yeah. solar system, I'm. I'm trying, I want, like, that's what Chris, that's what she came there looking for is the solar system. So that's a big part besides Tick that is, you know, something in the... Yeah, like, but this is, like, her love, right? So her seeing that, it was, like, enticing to her because mm -hmm. nobody knows what she's into because she was just always underneath George. Nobody knows she had these hobbies of being about the stars and yeah. that she was into science. So, like, this kind of helps bring that subplot out is when you see her carry that like a way to like look at it and kind of examine it and then with tech being the the enthusiast of a, of a of a student that he is 
he's doing research because of what happened to him. And then he finds out basically what this book is really about. And I think knowing if she gets it on her hands is why he's also trying to get rid of Christina in a way. Yeah. And to not harm her from Letty. If I'm not mistaken, is that the first time they, they become like kind of an item? Was that that house party, right? Yeah, because that's when that guy was like, uh, you stay in your run free, you need to let her know. And then that's when they first, you know, have sex and everything. Yeah. Right. Um, and then literally minutes after them having sex, that's when they start burning the cross and then Letty then <laughs> All of that issues started coming about, yeah. You know, and just they everything to a T like yeah. the way that they dress the way that the house was built um even to see like when she first bought the house like it was run down you know yeah. run down and I really think that those people were mad that you know they fixed up the house and made it look nicer than the houses across the street you know right. and, and, you know it just <laughs> they should have an HOA or whatever those things are called <laughs> you know <laughs> No, I think it's that, but it's also what upsets them more, I think, is that um, how can she afford this, right? It's like, yeah. a, how can she do it and I can't kind of thing. It's always that, like, why does she have this? It's always jealousy. It's ridiculous. Right. So it shows a lot of a lot, things that we're dealing with today, right? Especially in different suburbs and stuff. Although Chicago's not a suburb, it's, it's sectioned off like that because they have homes and stuff. They have houses. So it's very And I feel like even till still till this day, Chicago is kind of like that. Right. It's, it's from the way they make it sound like it's like the north side is predominantly white. Like they're not even like in the south side like that or anything. So yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely different for sure. So for me, I guess, what's your most sci-fi moment? Mine's is, the, 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 there wasn't much sci-fi moments, only somewhat, it wasn't even sci-fi. The, the biggest moment that wasn't all um, realistic was like the spirits all holding each other's hands just to like, to me, that was like the most yeah. out there thing that happened outside of like you hearing the different things throughout the house, throughout the whole episode. It was just that one moment where the voodoo woman who's supposed to help them break the spell is the one that got her ass kicked somehow. <laughs> but I don't even think that's scientific. I feel like- No, no, it's not. Paranormal, that's why- right? I would say more paranormal for sure. So like, I don't think it was big scientific moments in this one. It was more just a paranormal activity moment, basically. No, I feel like the scientific thing is when, you know, Hippolyta found the, the solar system. The solar system, system. yeah. That's yeah, kind of like the most it, then, you know. thing. Yeah, and then, like, the conversation she had with her dad about it, where she was so excited, like, Dad, I don't even know where this is from, but it's interesting. And th that was a phone call, right? Because I don't think we ever saw him. Okay. No, she was on the phone talking to her dad. Um, but, yeah, that, like, I think it was more of a paranormal episode in a way. Um, yeah. But even, you have to see, um, just before we talk about it, well, close up if we are um there was a scene where christina was playing with the the little kids in the neighborhood being you know being a child you know being able to play and then all of a sudden you know the you mean D came. or no it was christina christina was playing with you know the white kids of the neighborhood she was playing hide and seek with them and they oh. were like like they were trying to explain to her how to play and she he's like what is this your first time and she's like yes, it is my first time playing. <laughs> like, just to see her, like, you know, what is she, a vampire or a sorceress or something? She, yeah. Their age is different. You know, like, she could be a million years old, but she didn't really get to, you know, have a childhood like these kids are. So to do something for the first time, like, you could see how excited she was, and then all of a sudden the police came and took her. Right, And then they came you know, and went to go handle things because she showed up unannounced, right. you know, in a way. Um, but I saw that and I, I enjoyed that with that because I do like Christina. Um, I think she's one of the, the secondary characters that I do like. She's not even secondary, right? You don't know if she's a protagonist or an antagonist. You just know she's not for tech and she wants to finish what her yeah. father started. That's all you would really know about her somewhat. Especially for right now, you know. Right. Eventually we'll learn more about her, but I do like her character. Um, and, you know thing she's playing right now <laughs> so i think that's really it what what's the stars ratings you give this one this one was probably my least favorite just because it was too much um 
it was just a little too spooky for me. I'm not into like horror movies, so like it was just a little yeah. too much and stuff. Yeah. So I'm not I would, into <laughs> although the show was executed very well and the parts I've enjoyed, I really enjoyed, I would give it a three and a half just because this is where I had to make the critical decision if I'm going to keep watching or stop watching because of that one episode. I was like, if it's doing more of this, I probably won't be into it. Yeah. And thank God it wasn't. So therefore, like, I was like, okay, it was just this one episode, even though there's a little bit more of this stuff, but it's not as crazy and we'll get into i guess when that other episode comes about but that was really my thoughts on episode three i'll probably give it three and a half stars yeah um although I, it can get four from me but like because of that it was just three and a half yeah i feel like it's not my favorite episode but it had favorite moments so right. i agree with you it's probably gonna get a three point you know three and a half because it was a lot going on, but it just was a, it was a research, it, not a filler, but kind of a filler. It was like, setting it was up for the rest of the season. Of right. Yeah. Like that's the filler it was. It was setting it up for the, you know, the rest the of the season. Of the and season. you got to learn a little bit more about Hippolyta and D, you know. Right. You this this was more about them a little bit, of, of them grieving and dealing with loss in their ways and yeah. finding things that get, bring them closer to George. Yeah. Or finding themselves now after George, I should say, even more. Yeah. So and I do like I'm I'm happy that Ticks tried to step up. You know, it, it's hard, yeah. you know, but he did a really good job for what he was, you know, there for. And no, absolutely. It three out of three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. That's that's what I'm going with too. So I wanna thank you again, Jesse, for doing episode three. Americana Poe, writer to writer with the Lovecraft edition. So thank you for even doing this with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Everyone, please like and subscribe. And um, Jesse also has a podcast that I would like her to mention about. Hi, guys. I have a new podcast. It's called Everyone's Entitled to My Opinion. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's EE2MO. Um, I will be having new episodes soon. And I'm excited to start this because this is a lot of fun to do it. Um, but thank you for having me. No, thank you for doing this. This is Americana Quote, Writer to Writer. Take care, guys.